Hello and welcome. I'm Benedict de Montlor, the CEO of World Monuments Fund. I'm delighted to welcome you all for our 2021 Paul Mellon Lecture. This lecture is supported by the Paul Mellon Endowment Education Fund, and each year focuses on a critical issue in the field of cultural heritage. As we are approaching the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the war in Afghanistan, we wanted to reflect on the state of cultural heritage in this country. What has happened to it in the last 20 years? And what will happen with the current negotiation with the Taliban? Is cultural heritage taken into account as we are talking about the withdrawal of American troops? There are very few regions of the world as steeped in history as Afghanistan. It is considered the road of cultures. And the rich historic fabric of Afghanistan is a result of centuries of contact and exchange between civilization, empires, and religions. As one of our speakers of today, Rory wrote in his book, Afghanistan is the place in between the desert and the Himalayas, between Persian, Hellenic, and Hindu culture, between Islam and Buddhism, between mystic and militant Islam. The challenges facing cultural heritage in Afghanistan predates 9-11. At that time, the country has already, had already been at war for two decades. And we all remember the tragic destruction of the, Bamian, of the Buddhas of the Bamian Valley in March 2021. How do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Is it possible to build a national census around cultural heritage in Afghanistan? And can cultural heritage preservation projects help build resilience in this country? So to help us answer these questions, uh, I'm delighted to welcome three fantastic speakers today. So first of all, we have Omar Sharifi joining us from Afghanistan and a big storm there. So I hope we won't lost him uh, in the conversation. So hello, Omar. Uh, Omar is an assistant professor of social sciences and humanity at the city of Afghanistan and country director of the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies. We have also with us Shoshana Stewart. Hello, Shoshana. Uh, Shoshana is the CEO of Turquoise Mountain, an international NGO working in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan to revive historic neighborhoods and traditional crafts in order to create jobs, skills, and a renewed sense of pride areas where culture is under threat. And finally, we have with us Rory Stewart, Rory, a British diplomat, author, and explorer, whose 2002 journey, walking solo across Afghanistan, is recounted in the New York Times bestseller, The Places in Between, which I recommend highly, if you haven't read it already. Um, so before we begin, I should mention that we will have a 10-minute Q&A at the end of this conversation. So please don't hesitate to post your questions through the chat, and we will go through as many of them as possible at the end of this conversation. So to start it, I would like to ask each one of you to transport us to Afghanistan and to talk to us about a site or a monument in these countries that is meaningful to you and that represents the wealth and significance of cultural heritage in that country, but also maybe the current challenges that it is facing. So maybe we can start with you, Shoshana. Can you tell us about a monument that is particularly meaningful? Of course, of course. I'd love to show you a picture of it. Um, this is the Great Sarai, and it is smack in the middle of the old city of Kabul. And it's a building I love because we've been in that building for well over a decade. It was my office, but it is so wonderfully Kabul architecture. The outside are these blank mud walls, and then you walk into this interior courtyard, and it's that. It's these delicately carved cedar colonnades and flowers everywhere. The morning glories trained up the side, and in fact, this is the exact season, and the morning glories are creeping right now. So this is Kabul to me. And this is a picture taken in the middle of, of an ongoing conflict. So that is that is what it looks like today. And that is, what, that is what I hope it will continue to look like. Pretty amazing as an office. I'm very jealous. Um, 
Rory, when we read your book, I feel like we are with you every step contemplating the fascinating landscapes of incredible people of Afghanistan. But okay, I'm sure there are also sites that it's particularly dear to your heart. Oh, Rory, I think your mic is, uh, I think you're muted. The great classic mistake on all these things. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I would choose the uh, a building that I walked past, this is it, in the Bamiyan Valley in central Afghanistan, which was right at the very center of my walk. And it pissed me because uh, many people watching will recognize it as a caravanserai. The caravanserai are these castles which are built a day's walk apart right along the Silk Road, effectively connecting China and India to the Mediterranean and Europe. And this, of course, is, is how lapis lazuli from Afghanistan was moved, how silk But this is a particularly interesting caravanserai, and it's one that we're now looking at restoring because it is right at the meeting point of different empires. The chain of caravanserais going east into India were restored by the Mughal emperors. The chain of caravanserais going west towards Turkey were restored by Persian rulers. Uh, and this is a process that uh, went on over many, many, many centuries. But the building that you're looking at is a building from the early 17th century, still beautifully preserved in a place where I hope that we're going to be able to work with local Afghan weavers to create jobs for women through weaving carpets. Wonderful. Uh, that's uh, incredible. And, um, and, and, and so, Omar, can you tell us about the site you've chosen? Well, hello, and thank you for having me here. This site actually has, is very dear to me, not because I've, it's very historical and it's very beautiful, but also that I spent a full year um, studying around it and writing my, when I used to write my dissertation. It's a shrine built in 15th century, believed on the site of another one that was built 500 years before. It's a shrine dedicated to Ali, the fourth Caliph of Islam. But for us in Afghanistan, it's actually a celebrate Nowruz, the new year in, uh, in our tradition. And in a place that actually, which is kind of a pre-Islamic tradition, but we celebrate it in, in, in an Islamic shrine. And to me, it kind of represents the past, connects with the present in order to actually give us a glance of what the future might look like. So it's a very important and very dear to my heart, the Shrine of Ali in Mazar Sharif. No, thank you. And I, I think so with the sites, we, you, you already gave us an idea of how rich and diverse uh, the cultural heritage uh, is in this country and reflects so many uh, influences. So uh, maybe to give our audience a little bit of background on what cultural heritage represents in Afghanistan, uh, Omar, um, as a political scientist, you could give us some, some background about the importance of cultural heritage in the formation of Afghanistan as a modern nation. When we were preparing for this talk a few weeks ago, you told me that in fact, cultural heritage, according to you, was one of the three pillars uh, of Afghanistan. I was fascinated by that. So I would love you to share this analysis with uh, our audience. Well, thank you. Actually, it's actually true. Going back hundred years from now, and after the third Anglo-Afghan war, Afghanistan was the only independent Muslim country in the world at that time. And the Ottoman Empire fallen, and so a lot of people kind of in that time thought about Afghanistan become kind of the center of another caliphate or something. But the kind of the fathers of the kind of a modern nation of state in Afghanistan thought otherwise. And when they kind of imagine what Afghanistan as a nation, a state, as a country and a state, though Muslim, look like they kind of put it on in three principles, or three, based on three principles. The first was obviously we are Muslims, but at the same time, we are Muslims from Afghanistan. So beside the law of Islam, they actually drafted a constitution as the first pillar of being kind of a modern nation, a state. And the second was like, as a nation, we were made of men and women. So universal education pioneered by the queen of that time, Queen Soraya, was kind of become the second pillar. And the third was archeology. span because they thought like as Afghanistan being as a nation must have a past that exists beyond sort of 
before the religion of Islam and kind of then kind of mixed with Islam. So in a sense, they kind of made archaeology the second, the third pillar of Afghanistan as a nation state. And that's why in 1922, they invited the French Dafa, the French archaeologists, for the first in this region, actually, to come and start the excavations and to kind of study some Afghanistan monuments and stuff. So in a sense, until from 1919 all the way, 1920s all the way until the coming of the Taliban, and even today specifically, cultural heritage for Afghanistan was kind of, is a pillar of not who we are, but what we were as a place where different cultures, religions and empires and all the thoughts and philosophies, but in a way kind of give us an, a meaning of, that kind of gave meaning and face actually to the diversity of cultures, the diversity of, the diversity of the peoples and beliefs that actually made and, and is part of what the constitutes what is today Afghanistan. So in a sense that kind of remained very, very central, central piece in Afghanistan and Afghanistan as a country, as an Afghanistan, as an identity from everybody else. No, and that's why in 1996, when the Taliban took power, they made sure that actually these things were sort of erased. Constitution was abolished, girls were banned from going to school, and they targeted the cultural heritage and historical heritage of Afghanistan and destroyed the Buddhas of Bamiyan, beside many, many other sort of other cultural heritage. So archaeology, cultural heritage and historical monuments for us and kind of historical past of Afghanistan is just not something that's there, but something that actually is the heart of us as being a nation and being a people. But and is that true for normal people? Like what was the reaction in the street when the um, Buddha of Bamiyans were, were destroyed? Like this uh, attachment to cultural heritage and recognition of it's important, is it only the case for very educated people, people who are cultured or would you say it's a widespread feeling? I am. Um, I, I think it's. Um, I can tell you a story of my mother when, in April 2000, 2000 Taliban destroyed it. My Bob Buddha, Bob Buddha's of Bamiyan located in like in the central Afghanistan, where the majority of the people are Hazaras and Shias. But my mother is from Kabul and Shias. And once, like it was announced that the Buddhas were destroyed and the museum museums were looted and destroyed, my mother cried in a sense that said that, oh, now the past is erased. They're trying to erase the past. That means that how can we think about the future? Because for us sort of living in a country that sort of never been directly colonized, for us, history means something else. There is no disconnect. If, if like there's a famous anthropologist once asked a, a farmer, what do you think about this area? The farmer told him, like, you should have come here before Genghis Khan. It was much beautiful. It was 700 years ago. So in the minds of that anthropologist, Thomas Barfield, it was like a sense of how things work. So for us, in a way, history works differently. And these cultural monuments or historical monuments, just not there. If you look at all the stories about the Buddhas of Bamiya, they are not just simply the Buddhas. They become part of a great love story about two lovers, Shamoma and Sansal, who were just there and kind of lived together. And they lived as a kind of a monument of love for us. Or the stories about the Shrine of Mazar. So it's related to the pre-Islamic story of like Siawash, which is in, written in Shah Rama, the Book of the Kings, written in 10th century. So these kind of cultured hit Afghanistan something, I think something that connects with the past and history and sort of something that determines what we can be in the future. Because there's just not there, there are a lot of stories. It's kind of connected with the life of everybody. And that's what makes them very special for us. No, thank you for this uh, very passionate uh, explanation and, and very touching about your mother uh, crying when the Buddhas were, were destroyed. Um, Rory, uh, we all, I mean, many of us know about uh, your trip, not on the traces of Genghis Khan, but on the traces of Babur. And uh, I'm, I'm really curious to, to know, you know, y you had been walking across so many countries, fascinating countries with fascinating uh, cultural heritage, uh, India, Pakistan, Iran. So what was so uh, special during wo your walk about the cultural heritage in Afghanistan that it gave you the idea of creating an NGO devoted to its protection? Well, thank Can you. Can you tell I us mean, more as about as your you trip? Of <laughs> course, yeah. as you were saying, I walked across uh, India and Nepal and Pakistan and Iran, but it was really in Afghanistan that I found the center of my walk after nearly, I suppose I'd walked for nearly 21 months, stayed in about 550 village houses night after night. 
Um, but it was in Afghanistan that I really fell in love with the culture and the beauty. And I think there are a number of aspects of this. One is the sense of these extraordinary monuments. This is about uh, nine days into my walk. This is Chiste Sharif. And this is a mausoleum of a dancer from the order of Dervis to Islam into India in the 12th century. It's been struck by a Russian tank ship and see the hole in the top. It is a reminder also of a moment when Afghanistan, through its many changes, the most bewildering history, but a moment during its many changes when Afghanistan controlled an empire that stretched from Delhi to Baghdad, uh, the empire of Afghanistan, which ended when the leader of the dynasty made the mistake of killing the grandson of Genghis Khan, uh, leading to the extinction of this empire. Um, I think it's also important to understand, for me, the extraordinary sense of history that Umar Sharif was talking about, and the sense that because many people in these communities are descended from a single great grandfather, there is a very, very deep attachment to the soil, the local soil, a very deep difference between one community and another. So a much stronger sense of identity than I get, for example, walking across the United Kingdom or the United States, a sense that each community is very different from the other. Um, I wanted though particularly to focus on this monument because this is a structure first visited in person by a foreigner in the early 90s. And to give you a sense of its size, that's a horse at the bottom. It's about 165 feet high. When it was first found by foreigners, obviously the local people knew it was there, uh, they discovered that in turquoise blue tiles written around the neck was Sultan Giyasuddin Ghori Ibn Sam, King of Kings. And then around the shaft of the minaret, the Miriam Surah of the Quran, the mother of Jesus. And after an enormous amount of speculation, the conclusion was reached that this was the last legacy of the Turquoise Mountain, which had been the capital of this great Afghan empire that stretched from Delhi to Baghdad, destroyed by Genghis Khan, and that this had been the minaret of the Friday Mosque. And that Genghis, in destroying completely the city, had left the single minaret stand to leave posterity with a sign of what was there. And climbing up to the top of this minaret and looking down, I was astonished to discover a very large number of villagers collected around the bottom of the minaret who were looting the site. And it was that that really began my focus on Afghanistan, brought me to Muradhani, led us to restore nearly 160 buildings in the old city of Kabul and to work on uh, buildings such as the caravansary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you make us all want to go uh, to Afghanistan and to see this uh, legendary uh, minaret. Um, you founded your, your foundation, Turquoise Mountain, um, shortly after, and uh, World Monuments Fund partnered with Turquoise Mountain to protect one of the historic, uh, the last hist one of the last historic neighborhoods of Kabul, of old Kabul, when we put on the watch list in 2008, Murad Kani, which is this neighborhood. And um, so I'm going to turn to Shoshana, who is uh, now the CEO of Turquoise Mountain, to ask her uh, to talk to us about the activities of Turquoise Mountain, what has been going on since the inscription of Murad Kani, watch list, has it had an impact, and what is the extent of your work now in Afghanistan? Thank you. Um, love to. And just to, to pick off uh, on where you left off, the watch list was the beginning of everything for us because we started, and I'm hoping a picture can come up of the of the old city, and it's actually where that building that I showed you at the beginning is. Great story, smack in the middle of that. So this is Murad Khani, and it is one of the great historic neighborhoods of the old city. But after, at that point, 30 years of war, it was basically three feet deep in garbage. And so the World Monuments Fund put this neighborhood on the watch list and that put it as a protected site. We got it uh, you know, enlisted in that way through the president of Afghanistan into Afghan law. 
and we were born. So Turquoise Mountain was started uh, about 15 years ago now in 2006, and it was between the Afghan president and His Royal Highness Prince Charles, our, our founding patron. So off we set with the idea that we were going to preserve Afghan culture and heritage. And that was both about historic buildings and traditional crafts. So we're sitting here looking at these six feet of garbage, trying to figure out what to do. And so we just started clearing. So this is a before, during, and after picture. And we've cleared out about 30, that's not after, that's after. <laughs> we've cleared out about 30,000 truckloads of garbage out of the old city. And then we started restoring the building. So this is before and after. And this is another one. And in fact, that is the, the building that I first showed you, the Great Sarai before. And there's the picture again after. So we've restored over 150 of these buildings and they are such spectacular buildings. And one of the things I love talk, listening to you speak, Omar, about this sense of, uh, of Afghan history going back unbroken and people's real connection to the time of Genghis Khan. Every single, without fail, senior Afghan that I have taken through this area has said that they remember this is like their grandfather's house. And it's just, it's so central to, to identity, this pride in these beautiful buildings. We put in water supply, sanitation, electricity down every street to, to every house. And we trained uh, over 4,000 builders on the site, masons, carpenters, electricians, architects, engineers. There they are. And then we worked with the community to do all the things that you do with the community. People weren't going to school, they weren't going to a doctor. So we set up a primary school, set up a community health clinic, which has now seen over 130,000 patients. So we have spent the last 15 years day in, day out with this community. And the other side of things is another type of heritage, of course, of intangible traditions, of craft traditions. So this is embodied in Abdul Hadi, and Hadi was the great lattice jolly maker of Afghanistan. He worked for the king, I mean, he was a famous man. But when we met him, he was 72 and he was selling bananas in the bazaar, and he had been for 15 years. He had no markets, he had no students to whom he could pass on his skills. That's how a tradition dies, khalas. So we basically brought him out of retirement and brought a number of retired craft masters out of retirement and built an institute around them, training in woodwork, in ceramics, in calligraphy and miniature painting, and in jewelry making and gem cutting. We also realized very quickly that the training was important. You had to train the next generation, but if they couldn't make an income on what they were making, it wasn't going to work. And so we learned a lot of difficult lessons in how do you bring these things to market, but eventually began, began to, to sort ourselves out. And our first big commission was for the Connaught Hotel in London. So every single thing made in the suite was made in Afghanistan. It's called the Prince's Lodge. All the window bays, the doors, that four post carved walnut wood bed. We work with Asprey to create these stone boxes in lapis lazuli and onyx, all very beautiful Afghan stones. And then carpets is a huge part of our lives in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has, of course, been one of the great uh, hand-woven carpet centers of the world forever, and it still is. There are almost a million weavers across Afghanistan. And so we are working with over 5,000 of them across the country, making traditional and contemporary carpets, uh, fair trade verified. And one of the centers for this is Bamiyan and for us. And so Rory mentioned this caravan Sarai. It is the most extraordinary building. So we're going to restore it. but the way that we do things is, is about giving a building life. It is about heritage, but about making people's lives better through heritage. And so uh, I suppose this comes back to what the World Monument Fund did by putting Murad Hani on the watch list. And what I hope we can do by preserving this monument is it is about the bricks and the mud, but it is about the community that, that takes care of that and that feeds off of it. And so um, that has, been what the watch list did for us in Murad Honey, and I'm incredibly grateful for it. So it's it's great to be back here talking about it. Uh, thank you, Shoshana. And you're right. I think all of us, what motivates us uh, at Turquoise Mountain, at World Monument Fund, is of course to, to preserve those monuments that we are in awe of. You know, it's so extraordinary to visit those places. 
but more than that, to work with the local communities to create opportunities for contemporary people around them. And I think what you just explained, like, shows like the incredible amount of work and of care and attention to the sustainability of your project, to the long-term impact. It's really uh, very impressive. So, so thank you to, to the, the three of you for giving us some background about like your uh, vision of uh, Afghan as a modern uh, nation and the role of cultural heritage, but also your experiences working or working in Afghanistan. And now I would like really to turn to uh, what we are living now and, and what's happening and what's um, even more importantly, what's going to happen uh, in the next few months. So we all know that uh, President Biden announced uh, the departure of American troops. And um, we are very concerned, I think all of us on that screen, but I'm sure there are many other people about what that will mean uh, for cultural heritage uh, in this country. Do, is there a risk that the Taliban will come back and start destroying uh, heritage again? And is this question uh, evoked at all in the current negotiations? So I know, Omar, you, you're following those talks uh, quite closely. So can, can you talk to us about that? <clears throat> yes, um, obviously there is a lot of about the whole idea of like Taliban coming back and more importantly, Taliban destroying the cultural heritage in Afghanistan. Not for any other reason, but because I think, despite all kind of putting Taliban in different contexts politically, but at least for us in Afghanistan, we don't see Taliban just as so sort of like an Afghan phenomenon. We don't see them as some sort of a group of just hardliner Muslims. Because at the same time, we're all Muslims in Afghanistan, it's kind of a Muslim majority country. It's the point is like how they, their vision and their vision our understanding of Taliban is that when we think about Islam as kind of a sort of something that permeates life in modern and in among many Afghans, uh, our Islam, our like Islam in Afghanistan tradition has been a very historical and traditional Islam. By traditional does not mean it's simply ritualistic Islam, but Islam that's connected with history, Islam that's connected with uh, literature, and Islam that's a faith. What we feel, what what we actually witnessed in the past with the Taliban. And what we're seeing today, Taliban Islam is an ideology. And in an ideology, the way they act and behave, there's a very little space for any other sort of like space to think or a space to create. And therefore, there is a huge concern. It didn't mean that Afghans just simply wait for internationals to save them or something, because even before the coming 9-11, a lot of Afghan archaeologists, archivists, and others try their heart and actually at the risk of their own life to preserve what they can. To this, like for instance, the archives, the National Archives of the RTA, and other even the National Gallery of Afghanistan, in which they kind of change the paintings or hide the paintings and stuff. So they, uh, um, uh, in a way, they, they did their best. But today we really fear, in fact, nobody thinks about it. It's also quite concerning. And that's why recently a lot of, uh, many Afghans, educated Afghans, normal Afghans, civil society people, just ordinary people, were trying to actually come together with some way to bring this issue of preservation of cultural heritage of Afghanistan in the peace talks. And we're trying to kind of draw something through the UN, through the international community, through the Afghan government to actually push that idea and bring it in front of Taliban to just actually ask them whether or not to destroy the cultural heritage. We do that. Why? Because we know that there are a lot of elements within the Taliban movement who actually look at these things but that as, as something, as a symbol that they by destroying them, they can connect to a larger community of jihadists. That's exactly what they did it before, as I mentioned. They wanted to erase a part of our history that defined us as a nation state for 20th century, from the constitution to women's rights and archeology. span So I, we have, and I'm not sure if a Taliban might change, but I believe there are certain elements within the Taliban who might be able to understand the tremendous changes that happened in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. And I, we hope that with the help of community, we put, and, and, and also like the efforts of here, we put pressure both on Afghan government and also the international community to actually push that with the Taliban and even to the Taliban. Oh, thank you, Omar. And I would be curious, uh, Rory, uh, you're not only working uh, across many countries, but you're also a politician. So uh, in your view, as a politician, do you think there is any chance uh, for cultural heritage to be taken into consideration during these talks? I think it's very, very difficult. Um, one of the very sad things is that although, as Umar says, it is actually much more fundamental to Afghan national identity than people acknowledge, 
that one of the first things that you see when you arrive at Kabul airport is a huge image of Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was one of the, the most famous resistance to the Soviet occupation, uh, which says a nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. It's the first thing that hits you at the airport. So this is very, very central to the way that Afghans think about themselves. But complicated cultural story because contains within it legacies of uh, even just in the last 2000 years of a Persian civilization and Zoroastrian religion of its moment center of Buddhist research. It had a Hindu identity. It had a Jewish identity, synagogues in Kabul, as well as the Islamic identity. And even within the Islamic identity, there are different forms of Islam. That uh, dome that I showed you, for example, on the Chistia order of dervishes, which is a Sufi. So that is uh, from the Taliban. And as uh, Umar says, they are often looking for these sort of grand dramatic acts of global demolition, which can appeal to jihadists in the Sahel and North Africa, which can appeal to people in Syria. So uh, it is a very, very difficult moment. I think the key thing is, is to everybody uh, to remain engaged, not to shy away. Of course, Afghanistan is a difficult place to work in, but you know, I, that uh, building that I was in in Bamiyan, I visited the end of last year, in the middle of coronavirus, and there is an extraordinary vibrant community there, working, prospering. Shoshana was back in Afghanistan last month. Umar is, of course, speaking to us directly from Kabul at the moment. This is a very, very vigorous, active, living society, and we need to retain our commitment to it, and above all, our commitment to cultural heritage. We mustn't give up. We mustn't fall into what I would call a lazy pessimism. Yeah, no, I agree with you, and, 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 and this is a, a shared commitment, I guess, in the community of, of, of cultural heritage preservationists. Uh, we are, I think, all of us also supported uh, by Ali Foundation, that is a very active in post-conflict situation. And, and, and this is part of their role too, is to help us continue uh, this, this fight for cultural heritage, even though sometimes some people may think that's a bit crazy. Why are you doing some cultural heritage projects in such difficult situation? But, but we think this instill a sense of pride in people and that it, it encourage everyone to work together to, to, uh, about something they care about, that we all care and that can represent a source of reconciliation. But uh, there are many questions uh, from our audience, uh, Shoshana, about what you're going to do. What are you going to do uh, with Turquoise Mountain if uh, the Taliban come back? Sure. Um, and, and just to also talk about what you all were just talking about, which I, I have this very strong sense that we look at other countries in a very binary way, right? Is Afghanistan going to succeed or fail? or in this conversation, are they going to destroy a cultural heritage or leave it? And of course, you have the example of the destruction of the Buddhas as a very binary thing. It happened and they were destroyed. But so much is not like that, right? This has been the worst possible year in Afghanistan, the worst security situation since the early 2000s and coronavirus, right? But we, have ne we had our best month ever in 15 years last month of bringing Afghan products to market. We sold more carpets, jewelry than we ever have before to New York, LA, London, Tokyo, Australia. And that means in the case of carpets, we've created 7,000 jobs in the carpet industry in the last two years alone in this quite bad situation. And that's 7,000 women who are not only making an income, but who are also maintaining that generational tradition. And so in the midst of all of this, so much can continue. And so to your, to your question, uh, what can we do under what circumstances? So in the absolute worst circumstances of total breakdown of, of order, we, we can't, nobody can. But all, everything short of that, we can and we will. Um, different governments, different combinations of governments, we can work, we can separate men and women in classrooms we can and you've move, had quite a training you've had quite a training like all of us i guess during covid right all of us continued yeah. with our projects without traveling so how do you do that for people who don't know your secret <laughs> 
yeah, it's the great world of Zoom and WhatsApp like anybody else. I mean, actually, there's a, there's a mad thing that happens if you're talking about creating uh, products, which we do, where it's just a world of video tours around objects. So you're trying to show the, the quality and the finish on a piece of stonework or a carpet by zooming around it with your phone. But you can, you know, you can do it and people can... Uh, can do it outside in masks and everything else. It works. Basically, you can make so much work. Yeah, and I think also it's the also, answer I mean, is empowering. I, oh, please, Rory. Yeah, please, Rory. No, no, no. Just, I was just saying, but it still remains, of course, in this vote, unbelievably important to get on the ground. Um, you know, we, we also work together on a project where we're working in Jordan. We're working on uh, helping to restore and support an old Roman site called Unkais Gadara up on the Sea of Galilee. And both in our trips to Afghanistan and our trips to Jordan over the last few months, it is such an extraordinary difference to be able to get back on the ground and be with the team and just walk around and see what's happening. You notice a thousand things that you can't possibly pick up on Zoom. So we're very much hoping coronavirus fails. I, 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 I quite agree with that. We've been all, all of us, I guess, impressed by everything we can accomplish without traveling, but also very of everything we cannot. And uh, so it's very important, but, but I think like um, Tokoy's Mountain is very much like a well, monument found also in, uh, that uh, most of our teams are local and we train people, our teams are led by local people. So even though we cannot travel because of COVID of default situation, well, continue. Um, so, 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 so this is key and, 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 and local empowerment is, is really uh, crucial. Um, but Omar, I'm, I'm also interested if you if you could comment, uh, in fact, any of the three of you on, uh, you know, uh, when, when there is a, a situation like this one or a post-conflict, uh, some people may say, well, you know, it's more important to create a, 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 a non-profit for education or a non-profit for uh, addressing humanitarian needs. So what is your view as, a, as, a, as an Afghan, like uh, about a, a, a non-profit like Turquoise Monte, I'm sure you're going to say nice things, but, but I'm still curious about this hierarchy of needs. Well, for me, talking just in a sense, and because I think since like 2004, when I, we first, I first talked to Rory when he was managing, like planning that. Um, um, to me, Torquay's Mountain right now is like one of the monuments of the Holy Empire and stands and will continue to define what happened actually in the best possible way in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. Something that will continue for a bit, not just as a kind of a sole monument in the middle of the desert, but something that thrives. So, but uh, will thrive. But at the same time, of course, development help or humanitarian is important. But at the same time, we have to understand that Afghanistan has changed tremendously in the last 20 years in terms of the ability of us to know how um, how to take care of ourselves. And since in to 12, when the first time the internationals came to Afghanistan, we had no idea who they were. Our only experience with the internationals were during the Russians or the Anglo-Afghan -Anglo wars, if you just take out the hippie period of like 15 years. So we did not know what part of the world and all the atrocities that were committed in Afghanistan in the 1990s, including the destruction of the Buddhas and historical heritage, happened when Afghanistan was absolutely cut from the rest of the world and we had absolutely no contact. And I think for us, obviously, humanitarian is important, but what more important is engagement, continuous engagement with the world. And that will enable us to actually identify what we need and how we have to move forward. Maybe 20 years ago, there was a difficult for us because of the lack of language or English or something to actually explain to what Afghanistan needs. But today, it's a different thing. There's a generation who actually not only distinguished, but actually studied and know what we need. So I think engagement here for us, for the first, is very important. Now, why international community has to actually invest or actually think of the uh, funding or supporting cult preservation of cultural heritage in Afghanistan? And I think I'm just thinking about it in a very realistic sense. It is actually a test about the durability of the peace process or actually whether peace process is actually touchable. Talking with the Taliban, talking with our supporters about to see whether they have this commitment. I think we'll show whether the Taliban or these groups will committed to be part, to kind of be part of Afghanistan 
or just remain kind of a globalist jihadist network. So for, for me, in a sense, preservation of cultural heritage in Afghanistan is not just something about monuments, it's about also preserving us as a people and something that actually belongs not to us, but to the world. So it's just, in a way, it, it's a multi-layered way to look at it. But I, I believe, like the case of human rights in Afghanistan, like the case of the women's rights in Afghanistan, our freedom of speech and others, it's just not only about us, it's about like the world. And like working on that and focusing on like supporting these projects to help restore or actually preserve historical monuments, that actually is a very good test to see Afghanistan to kind of to kind of prevent further problems in the future. And actually the best contribution the world can do right now. And uh, thank you, Omar, for such an uh, impassionate call. Uh, but we, we have different questions uh, from the audience, and I would like to go through some of them. So I think one of them were, was very related to what you were talking about, this engagement, this new generation. And it was for, for you, uh, Shoshana, like to talk to us about these people that you are training, especially the women. How do they feel now? Like, what is, what is the feedback you are receiving? Uh, about what's happening and what may happen in the next few months. What do you hear from your staff? Um, it's a it, it's a good question. So I was there a few weeks ago, and I didn't want to assume that I was reading it right. So I I talked to the director of our institute, um, who's a man I've worked with for fourteen years, and I said, Ustad, um, do people wish we would close? Do people not understand we're not, why we're not closing the institute? And he just looked, and he's not a very sort of chest banging chief guy. He is a very thoughtful, quiet man. And he just said, absolutely straight, no, they do not wish you would close. They do not wish we would close our doors. They need to come to work. They want to come to work. That's the obvious people need to earn an income, but also you keep going. And, and I, you know, I, I didn't want to assume, but basically uh, people need and want to get on with lives. And I think, um, you know, Omar Johns can here? talk. Okay, yeah, of course. It's incredibly dangerous. I mean, I don't want to underplay just how bad security is. I mean, the assassination attempts across anyone in any level of government right now, it's very, very dangerous. But there is also a difference between what it is now and what it could be in a, in a seriously deteriorated state. So it's not as bad as it could be. And I think it's important to try to maintain um, how it is now. Um, and and this is something, it, just, I, I, yeah. something I feel very strongly. I mean, I, I was uh, this night to uh, American analysts and diplomats. Uh, one of them was the same. Well, you know, it's about the United States should just wash its hands of Afghanistan. Um, this is what I would call lazy pessimism. The truth of the matter, of course, as Umar has said, is that the situation in Kabul during the Civil War was far, far worse than anything we see today. You know, things can get much, much, much worse in Afghanistan. And it's extremely irresponsible to try to wash your hands and walk away. There's a lot that we can do as an international community to support and try to make sure that things don't deteriorate. Um, I just also wanted to sort of follow up on Uma's very moving words on cultural heritage and development, because it's true that, of course, it's very important to do education. But one of the reasons why investment in cultural heritage is important is it shows a form of distinctive respect. One of the problems, at least the some Afghans frame it to me, is I've had Afghans say to me, look, a lot of the other projects effectively seem to be saying you're not healthy, you're not educated, you're not treating your women correctly, right? But this cultural heritage projects say the reverse. Cultural heritage projects have something unique, right? Afghan crafts are the end of the world, right? These are very, very unique and beautiful things. People in New York and San Francisco want to buy and admire. It's giving agency to people. Uh, in a way that is difficult to do. I mean, it, it's a, it, it can be done properly. I think a, a, a way of giving agency, autonomy, respect to people in a, in a different way to the way in which some development projects are. And Benedict, oh, this uh, is the yeah. to you, uh, sorry to your question before, which is if people say, "Why are you doing cultural heritage in the middle of a war?" 
it is exactly this. And I, I have fallen in love with cultural heritage. It's not my training, actually. I've just been doing it for the last 15 years. And because in the most difficult of circumstances, actually it can be a very, very powerful lever to make people's lives better because basically it creates very good jobs, creates jobs very people are very dedicated to and, and fundamentally uses an asset in the country. It doesn't use a problem, it uses an asset. So actually a very, very good way. And I've watched it over the last year because all I do is run cultural heritage programs in places that are struggling, where hair is under threat. And they have been very, very resilient. We've been able to continue to do everything and more through the midst of coronavirus and increased conflict. People care about this. So it sticks. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It was very impressive during COVID to see how, in fact, we were part of the, to, to, to reopen in, uh, in many countries where, where we have. Um, I, I want to move to another question that was asked uh, by uh, the audience. Uh, from uh, Andrew Lawler from National Geographic. He, he asked whether the panelists can address looting. Has it increased or decreased in the past decade? And do you see signs that the Taliban is sincere in its February statement that they will halt illegal loot? So who wants to take this question? of this? Well, um, um, I can add and answer that like partially, not because I'm actually the exactly on that. What happened in looting was common war, quite. But then later, the Ministry of Culture actually created a special um, and kind of security force to protect the historical sites. And that like, decreased tremendously the amount of looting that happened in Afghanistan. And at the same time, what we've seen recently, actually, there was an attack a few days ago on this um, Mesa Ainak, this copper mine kind of facility that actually how also like is the site of the probably one of the biggest kind of a buddhist stupas and buddhist sort of a period cultural history, historical monuments there so there is a fear that might happen that may happen so far we do not hear it much because of that partially because of the security things and partially because no one's actually interested on that but my feeling my gut feeling and as based on what i'm hearing what i'm listening to is that um, there, um, there, the, the tr kind of the uh, smuggling of that was quite common before. It's still happening, but in a much kind of reduced level. Because if the security deteriorates, there is always a space for these type of people to kind of restart their work. And I'm not sure if the Taliban will kind of be able or wanted to prevent it because of the attack. We've seen that the attack happened on the Buddhist sites. And, and some people wanted to actually talk, some of them actually wanted to destroy the monuments and actually take part of that back to Pakistan. And I, I, I saw this very, very dramatically um, in the end of 2001, beginning of 2002, when I turned up at the Minare Jam, that huge minaret that I showed you a picture of, uh, which is right in the center of Afghanistan. This was in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the snow. I'd had to cross a 14,000 foot pass on foot to get there. And when I arrived, there was a Pakistani trader from Peshawar sitting, paying money. And he'd come to the Taliban period, two villages, to dig up and excavate the city. And then I turned up in Kuwait two years later and found a gold object that I'd last seen two and a half years earlier in Afghanistan in, in a Kuwait, and it had made its way through Pakistan. So it is an extraordinary, um, you know, dangerous industry, but it thrives in civil war, it thrives in illegality, and it thrived during the Taliban period because they didn't care about protecting these things. Yeah, that's quite uh, a story, a sad one, but quite a interesting piece from Afghanistan to Kuwait. Um, we have several questions also from our audience asking what uh, the international community can do and what regular people can do. So I think I will go like, uh, and that will be the, the last question that we take, like to the three of you, and, and it's a bit abrupt, but what is your call to action for uh, both regular people and also for people in charge, like governments or international community? So who wants to go first? Shoshana, well, do you want to take it or Rowie? Yeah. As the, yeah, the awful responsibility of a politician is always to be the person talking into the gap, and then I'll let the, my, my, my more thoughtful friends speak after me. Um, look, fundamentally, 
if you must remain committed, must remain committed. Please don't give up on Afghanistan. Uh, the lesson of all these places is that by giving up, you give space to much worse people. I had friends who were diplomats in the 1990s who thought that they could walk away from Afghanistan and that somehow it was none of America's business, none of the West's business. They did by walking away. They gave the space to Al Qaeda, to Pakistan, to Iran, to Russia, and to other people who caused much more hor horrifying situations in Afghanistan. So don't fall into the lazy pessimism. Remain engaged. Support. NGOs and charities on the ground in Afghanistan. And if you're the Afghan government, uh, the, uh, sorry, the American government, continue to provide the support to the democratically elected Afghan government. Do not wash your hands. Do not fall into this pessimistic fantasy of saying it's all too complicated, it's all too difficult. Because what we are doing is still very, very well helping to support an entire culture, and we're helping to support indirectly through the actions of the international community and the Afghan government and the Afghan people, the lives of many, many millions of people. And we mustn't lose faith. Thank you. It's, it's very clear that you are a politician. Excellent call to action. So uh, let's go uh, to conclude our event. Let's go to Yamar. Can you tell us like scene from Afghanistan where you uh, are now and you're following all these negotiations. What is your message? Uh, to the international community and to normal people all around the world who care about Afghanistan. Thank you for this opportunity. Afghanistan has transformed tremendously. And people often talk about preserving the events of the last past two decades about freedom of speech, women's rights, human rights, and all that thing. And can I tell you, it's not just achievement. As one friend of mine told me, I'm not going to wake up in a not waking up in the morning to see myself as an achievement. It's a fact, it's a reality of life here. All these values define today's Afghanistan. And today, maybe politically, it looks complicated, but the reality of these factors right now in we really determine what Afghanistan is future. And we can, like, together, with, with the help of the international community, we'll be able to preserve it. And we not only preserve it, but actually make it become sort of like the of Afghanistan of the 21st century. So my whole message is we need to remain connected because the only time we darkened the fog, fall into darkness was 1990s when we completely cut off. So, I mean, I advance, thank you all for your support, but I think remaining international engaged, remaining connected with the international community and engaged with the international community will determine a peaceful Afghanistan. And I have absolutely no doubt about it. Thank you so much. Uh, Omar, and, 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 and be sure that we will remain engaged. Uh, I know uh, Turquoise Mountain will. We will too at World Monuments Fund and many people uh, in the preservation community. So thank you all. all thank, you, uh, all you, uh, thank you for your uh, insights and analysis. Uh, thanks to our audience. And uh, I'm sorry for the uh, interruptions, but I think this was a really a fascinating uh, talk going on at the moment in Afghanistan and what we can do uh, about it. So if you want to uh, follow us, you can uh, look at our website, wmf.org, and register to our newsletters to receive news about our upcoming event. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.